Okay. We're going to be talking about um, amphetamines today and non amphetamine stimulants very briefly. Um, we'll talk about a brief introduction to amphetamines and sort of where they came from, the mechanism of action, pharmacological effects, cognitive effects, talk a little bit about dependence and tolerance, spend some time talking about methamphetamine, and then finally talk about a couple of non amphetamine stimulants, just in passing. Uh, and then our next topic up, of course, will be alcohol. But let's talk first about amphetamines. Much like uh, other drugs we've talked about, they are structurally, structurally defined that produce a variety of effects on the central nervous system and autonomic nervous system. These drugs are called sympathomimetic because they mimic the symp sympathetic nervous system actions. Um, as we talked previously when we talked about cocaine, um, these drugs have very powerful effects on the sympathetic nervous system, and amphetamines even more so, because they certainly activate uh, norepinephrine far more than they do dopamine, which is important. Uh, all amphetamines have an indirect action involving the presynaptic release of both dopamine and norepinephrine. It's one of the things that distinguishes them from cocaine is a much greater effect on, on norepinephrine. They have long been used to treat a variety of disorders. Currently available are amphetamine, which I have misspelled there, I apologize, which is Adderall. Adderall is just simply amphetamine, give them a new name because it's prescribed for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And dextroamphetamine is dexedrine, which is primarily used as a diet drug. Probably not the best idea in the world, but that is what it is often used for. These drugs are sometimes used also to treat um, sleep disorders where people fall asleep uh, unexpectedly and they are also used uh, sometimes to uh, as supposed cognitive enhancers and are also sometimes used by athletes to boost their performance. Uh, so again, currently these are the drugs we have available. They have historically been used for weight loss and to fight fatigue. Um, weight loss is probably not the best idea for these drugs, but they have been used for that. Um, I know in the 60s they were given to pregnant women to keep pregnant women from getting too heavy, which seems ridiculous, but I can tell you my mother was on dextroamphetamine when she was pregnant, and my father at one point came home and she was up on top of the refrigerator scrubbing. Um, so I'm not sure they were really the best idea in the world. Um, but uh, they are available and they are certainly used for a variety of legitimate and illegitimate, illegitimate activities. Uh, Adderall is probably one of the most commonly abused drugs on college campuses. It's used as a study aid. Um, I would hesitate to ask, but I guarantee there are some of you out there listening to this who have taken it or know where to get it. Um, it's Because it's widely available, people get prescriptions and then they just sell them. Um, so, uh, it's, you know, it's one of those things bound to happen. Um, as long as it's a limited use, uh, I think it's probably okay. Again, it's illegal, but um, it's not going to hurt you, provided that it's not something that you take excessively. Um, I don't think it should be used as a cognitive enhancer because its costs come too much with that. But um, I don't think it's appropriate to scare people. Uh, I think it's important that you have facts. And so understanding how amphetamines affect you uh, will allow you to make an informed decision on your own. Um, I'm not encouraging you to do so, but I want you to, to have all the facts. Okay, so how do they work? Well, they exert virtually all of their action by causing the release of both norepinephrine and dopamine from presynaptic storage vesicles. The mesolimbic system and nucleus accumbens are both associated with behavioral stimulation and motor activity. And oftentimes you can get obsessive compulsive disorder like behaviors from activation of the basal ganglia. So entirely dopamine and norepinephrine uh, mechanisms of action. In terms of their pharmacological effects, they again follow from the release of that dopamine from presynaptic nerve terminals, which include our increased flight, fight, fright response that is dose related. Metabolites are detectable in urine for 48 hours. Uh, with methamphetamine, 40% of the dose of methamphetamine is excreted unchanged. I can tell you that there are a number of methamphetamine abusers who do not let that go to waste. And I'll let you figure out 
how that gets administered. Um, there are, of course, harmful effects that follow from exaggerated doses and responses that include insomnia, restlessness, agitation, stereotyped behaviors, which are things like those repetitive actions, uh, purposeless repetitive acts, violence, paranoia, delusions, anorexia, psychosis, and progressive deterioration in physical and mental well-being. Uh, in methamphetamine users, you get this thing called Frankenstein syndrome, where people, for some reason, insist on taking things apart. And you can go into a methamphetamine user's house, and they will have taken apart the VCR, the phone, the TV, uh, because they just get into this weird, crazy activity. Um, you also, again, can get these sort of obsessive-compulsive disorder-like actions that border on the bizarre. You'll have a completely scrubbed kitchen counter inside a filthy house. Um, <laughs> So very strange behaviors that are associated with uh, their use. Uh, you can get what's called amphetamine psychosis with paranoid ideation, which can be persistent. Um, and uh, I, I think probably if you've watched enough TV, you've seen this. Um, watch Dogs of Bounty Hunter because they're always chasing people who are these crazy paranoid methods. Uh, methods particularly something I would never want anyone to use. Particularly bad for you, particularly the way it's used. And you're going to see here in a few minutes, in a few minutes, what it does to your face and teeth, etc. There are some cognitive effects of uh, these drugs. They have been shown to improve cognitive processing, speed, attention, concentration, and psychomotor performance. Again, this is why they've been so attractive as drugs of uh, use for um, getting pilot performance better for students. Um, but again, the costs can be fairly grave if, if these drugs are abused. Um, these effects, of course, underlie the use of these drugs to treat ADHD in adults and children. There are other drugs that are not amphetamines that are norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, which may work just as well um, and certainly may be safer for that. Uh, again, they are also used as performance enhancers for athletes. Although some of their fine motor coordination is lost, they have so much energy and ability to power their muscles uh, that they can gain a lot of performance. They're, of course, banned in most sports. Uh, at high doses, these are, of course, associated with anxiety and serious toxicity. So it's so important to keep in mind. These drugs, of course, have a high degree of dependence potential. They are prone to compulsive abuse. Physical dependence is easily induced in humans and in animal models. Um, relatively fairly simple to do. Um, tolerance to these drugs can develop quickly, resulting in the increased need for these drugs to get the same uh, mechanism of action. Withdrawal is associated with increased appetite, extensive sleeping, and depression. Um, I've known a lot of people that have come off some of these drugs and they sleep for days on end. It's what they need to do. Uh, and then they gain a lot of weight because you have to keep, keep in mind they've been in starvation mode for so long because their body has been in this fight or flight mode for for a long time. and so. Once that's over, the body's built to store things as fat in the event that one of those episodes comes along again. Um, and so while people will lose a lot of weight on amphetamines if they come off them, they will gain a lot of weight. So they're terrible weight loss drugs uh, for that very purpose. Uh, I want to turn next to talk about the primary drug of abuse in this class called methamphetamine. And I'm sure most of you have, have seen enough about this. Um, it has a variety of street names, ice, the Crank, Crystal, Tina. Um, it's readily manufactured from available chemicals, including pseudoephedrine, which is why you have to go to the pharmacy now to get pseudoephedrine. In fact, there's a move underway in South Carolina to make it prescription only. Um, this is a much more potent form of amphetamine, uh, methamphetamine is. Uh, crystal methamphetamine is a smokable form. It's actually heated and vaporized, not, not burned. Um, it's absorbed rapidly when it's smoked um, and it continues to be absorbed for about four hours. The half-life of methamphetamine is 11 hours. Um, this is the reason why this drug has such an abuse potential because it doesn't have to be constantly used um, and its effects are so long-lasting. Um, people will start on a Saturday and it'll be Wednesday before they've even thought about going to bed. And so 
that's a serious problem. Uh, they won't have eaten in that time. There's a lot of things that happen in that time. Again, talked about this a second ago, but 40% of this is excreted in the urine unchanged. People will drink their urine, other people's urine, have it administered as an enema. Lots of interesting um, ways to, uh, to go about that. Um, that ought to tell you how bad of a drug this is when you are drinking someone else's urine to get their methamphetamine. So keep that in mind. I want to talk about methamphetamine neurotoxicity. In an acute use, it is responsible for a variety of toxicities, including strokes and psychosis. Um, behavioral mental changes can persist, leading to speculation about long-term injury in the brain. Certainly in rodent studies, there's loss of both dopamine and serotonin neurons. Uh, in rhesus monkeys, this persists for up to four years, and more recently, there has been found a six to eight percent reduction in frontal cortical and basal ganglion neuronal density or neuronal contact in uh, methamphetamine abusers, abstinent for 12 months. So a year later, there's still an eight percent reduction in brain volume. So that's something we want to try to avoid. There are, of course, uh, long-term physical tools. Uh, people who smoke meth, the chemicals will eat away at their teeth enamel um, and will oftentimes lose all their teeth. The vasoconstriction and long-term starvation results in dramatic changes to body and looks. There's a, an entire website devoted to looking at mug shots of meth users. So here is one woman's evolution across 10 years. Um, pretty uh, awful. Here's another couple of folks. Uh, this is one woman two and a half years later. Uh, this is this guy three months later. Um, there's a couple things that will happen. This happens with cocaine too, but uh, in meth more often, people that have been up for a long time develop this weird form of psychosis where they think there are bugs underneath their skin and they start picking at their skin, which is clearly what this guy has probably been doing. Uh, I don't know what's happened to her, but um, they just lose so much weight and it's in weird places that they just end up with this god-awful uh, look. Hair starts to fall out. Um, it's certainly something you, you want to think twice about using. Um, there's a, a lot of, of information online about meth. Go on online and read it. it it's a bad drug. Um, okay, so we have non-amphetamine stimulants to quickly uh, talk about. Ephedrine, not used that much today. It used to be used a lot as an asthma drug. Uh, it's primarily, it, its effect is primarily in adrenaline. And then, of course, they have methylphenidate, which is Ritalin, which has a short half-life but blocks the dopamine transporter at presynaptic terminals and is used to treat ADHD. Okay, well, we're going to pick up and talk about alcohol next time.